Well, amen. We are in our series, The Life of David. And each week, we've been looking at a different part of David's story and, and learning about who God is through it and about what God wants for his people. And David, to this point, he's had a lot of victories. He's had a lot of success. Sure, he's had hard moments. He's had hard seasons. He's gone through a lot. But at this point, he's known for slaying the giant, for being Israel's greatest king. And where we find him today, as we start this next chapter of his story, is that he is on top of the world, so to speak. He's been given a covenant with God that his family would be a dynasty of kings, and this dynasty would lead to the greatest king, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the Messiah, Jesus Christ himself. And it's the greatest promise, I think, that anyone could hope to have given to them in this world. God says to David, I'm going to establish your throne, and you will have a dynasty of kings, and then you will have the king who will reign on the throne forevermore. It is one of the highest peaks in the Old Testament. And then the first series of chapters from 2 Samuel, they read just like, it's like a highlight reel. Just victory after victory, he's crushing it. David is the Michael Jordan of kings. Like he's the king that has set the bar to which all other kings have to be judged. Side note, everybody debates Jordan, LeBron. If you're always having to compare LeBron to Jordan, that tells you who's the goat right there, amen? But David sets the bar. And then in 2 Samuel chapter 11, the story slows down. And it takes a turn. And if the promise that the Messiah would come from his line is the highest, one of the highest peaks of the the Old Testament, what unfolds is probably one of the lowest pits. So if you have your Bibles, would you turn them on or open them up to 2 Samuel chapter 11? And we're going to go to verse 1. It says, In the spring, at the time when things go off, as when kings go off to war, David sent Yohab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I pray that you would speak to us today through your word. So let your Holy Spirit move and reveal your truth to us. In your name we pray, amen. So the Israelite army advances on the Ammonites and pushes them back into the city. And so the military situation that they find themselves in is called a war of attrition. Basically, it's both sides trying to wait the other side out, wait them out of resources, men, all those kinds of things, let weather take its toll. That's a war of attrition. So the Israelites have the city surrounded, and the thing about a A war of attrition is that it can take weeks, it can take months, it can even in some cases take years, depending on how well stocked the the city and the gates and the walls are. And so David's calling as king, part of his covenant with God as the king of Israel is to lead the men into battle. But he instead sends one of his trusted commanders, Yohab, out with the king's men, his men, to advance on the city, and he stays home. So already something is up. Something is off. Because through all all of 1 Samuel, David is like completely faithful to, to the what the Lord has called him to do. And it wouldn't really be until what we learned about last week when, when Kat shared that when David treated the ark, the, the container of the, the presence of God, recklessly and carelessly, that we would start to see some cracks in David's faithfulness. So David doesn't do his duty as king, and he stays home. And I think what we're seeing, really, it's at this point, it's not like scandalous or anything. What we're seeing is a king getting used to the comforts of being king. He's living the palace life, the high life, and it's starting to influence his behavior and his decisions because David is, like all of us, painfully human. 
Any of you feel that? Like I feel painfully human at times. David is painfully human. Moses is painfully human. Later on, the disciples, man, will they be painfully human. And so are we. Sometimes we look at these stories and we kind of idolize or we, we, we put them on a pedestal, these people. And there'd be a lot of reasons to do that up until really this point for King David. Like I said, he's been crushing it. He's got all these victories. But really, it's starting with the incident with the ark that some, some weaknesses start to show because he's almost been like a superhero to this point. And yet, if you look at this passage in the original Hebrew, the, the verbs will indicate that 11 times David would send others to do what the role of the king was to do. 11 times he would forsake what he was supposed to do. He's living the high life, the kingly life. It's getting to his head. Some weaknesses begin to reveal themselves. And so what happens now is that what should have been another great victory in the story of the faithful King David, we have instead the greatest tragedy and loss of his life. So our first point today, and I promise, is this one, this one's, this is why I'm sitting today. This, this story doesn't feel like a stand-up story. This feels like, let's sit down, let's talk about it, let's work through it, right? So I want you to write this down. This could be an intense point, but I promise, stick with me, okay? Number one, in our sin, a single wrong choice can lead to destruction. Choice. You know, it strikes me how powerful it is, the fact that you and I have choice. Perhaps that is one of the greatest benefits of being the image bearers of God, is that you and I, by God's command, by God's decree, have been given choice. God gave Adam and Eve a choice. He gives you and I choices. And it's crazy how easy it is for really even one sinful choice to completely derail an entire life's worth of victories and successes. You see, most sins start small. To Adam and Eve, it looked like just taking a bite of an apple. What what harm could it do? To David, it looked like staying home in the palace because, I mean, what's the point in the king going out to a war of attrition? that he's just going to camp there and be there for weeks, months, years. There's better uses for him and his time. And so why bother? You know, there's an ancient book called The Art of War. And it actually talks very little about actual combat and warfare. It talks more about the philosophy of warfare. And in it, the writer, Sun Tzu, he says, do not linger in dangerously isolated positions. Other words, if your army's in the wrong place, don't stay there. Move the army because you are setting yourself up for failure. And and, and what it is, is our life really is a series of choices. And it's the choices we make, but it's also the places that we find ourselves in. They They often kind of dictate the choices we make. And so in the art of war, it's don't stay in that compromised position because you're putting yourself in harm's way. You're, 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 you're putting yourself in a position where destruction is coming. So it, it, it's those small things, those small compromises, those little sins that, that, that often trick us into the greatest compromises in our lives. You know, there's a time before David was king where the only one he could rely on and trust was God. The only one who could help him was God. But now he lives in a, in a time and season of his life where he just turns and there's someone there at his beck and call to do the things he wants them to do. So to be clear, David hasn't really sinned yet, but he has placed himself in harm's way. The story goes on, verse 2. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace, and from the roof he saw a woman bathing. 
and the woman was very beautiful. The Hebrew indicates that it was late afternoon, so he's getting out of his bed around 6 or 7 p.m. I don't know what he was doing the night. He was playing Fortnite. Who knows? So you boys go off to war. I'm logging in with my boys. Where are we landing? That's so old. I'm so behind in my references. So he's not only put himself in a bad place, but he's being careless with his time. He's been in bed until evening. And he gets out, and I don't know, I don't know what he's got. He's got maybe a coffee, he's got a latte, who knows? He's just kind of moseying out onto the roof. He's neglecting what God has called him to do, and then and then he sees this woman. And James Clear, in his book, Atomic Habits, he talks about this idea called choice architecture. He says so many of our choices are influenced not just about, not from what we want, but where it is. And and he tells the story of a hospital where um, a lot of the people in the hospital were buying soda. They were buying soda instead of water. And the hospital's like, we would really prefer you to buy water and drink that during your recovery and your stay. And so what they did is they took the sodas out of the checkout line and they placed only water and then sales of that water went up 35%. And sales of soda went down 35%. They didn't put out advertising. They didn't do marketing. They just placed them in people's field of vision and the numbers increase. That's called choice architecture. And so big companies will use this idea. How many of you, when you go out to the store, what do you see? What's in the checkout line every time? That little refrigerator, right? By the way, does anyone think those little refrigerators are like super cool? I would love to have one in my house. That is how I would feel like I made it. You know what I mean? (laughs) But those little fridges, they always put them there, and they put the worst snacks, right? And, and why do you think they do that? So how many of us, we're doing our grocery list, we go through the shelves, and we might pass some of those things and be like, nah, no, I don't, I don't, I don't need it. I don't, I don't have the budget for it. But then when we get out to the checkout line, we see it again. You're like, well, it's not a whole, it's not a 12-pack of them. It's one. I'll get that one. And we get it, right? So Coca-Cola, the company, invests millions of dollars to make sure they are right there in your field of view as you check out. And because of that, their sales go up 55%. You know, the question is, what do you put before your eyes? David's in the wrong place. He should have been out at war, but he's back at the castle. He should have been out of bed, at least being productive, doing whatever it is kings do. Does anybody have any idea? What what do they do during the day? But he should have been doing that, whatever it is. But he puts himself in a destructive place. And because, make no mistake, you and I, we, we are so easily tempted in our flesh. So to put yourself in the wrong environment and then linger in it is a destructive combination. And a lot of us do that. It may not look like a rooftop to us, but for a lot of us, it might look like our phone screen. It might look like what's on our laptop. It might look like what we say to some people behind closed doors. What do you put in front of you? And a common misconception is that Bathsheba is bathing on top of her roof. She is not. She is in her home. There is a window And you can see, and back then, because it was so hot, most people actually bathed in the evening. And David, he is at the highest point. He's in the palace. He has a commanding view of the city. He can see everything. And David isn't at this point trying to put himself in harm's way. It's not like a bad intention, but he's looking over the city and he sees into the home of Bathsheba and she's bathing. By the way, anyone else find it funny that her name is Bathsheba and she's back bathing? It's weird. So in verse three, it says, and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. 
So the servant, in kind of a subtle way here, if you don't know, if you don't look these people up, so Eliam is a decorated war veteran of the armies of Israel. He's someone David knows. And Uriah is, see, it, it mentioned that Yohab was sent out with the king's men. Well, David had 31 elite soldiers. They're the Navy SEALs of his army. Uriah is one of them. That also explains why Bathsheba is, just because you have a view of a city doesn't mean you could see everything in the city. The reason David can see Bathsheba is because one of David's elite soldiers, the homes are all near the palace. So he can easily see into Uriah's home. And I think the servant's being like, this is the, this is the wife of your boy, you know? And this is where he really messes up because him seeing her bathing, that's kind of just wrong place, wrong time, right? He just kind of stumbles into that. But now he's, he's following the curiosity. Now he's acting upon it, the temptation. And it happens so quick. And that's often the trap of sin in our lives. We, we get that temptation and it just can happen so quick. Verse four, then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him. He slept with her, and now she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanliness. So this is why she's taking the bath. And actually, that's polite Bible speak to say that she is done with that time, and she's actually uh, fertile. And then it says, then she went back home. And then verse 5, it gets worse because it says, the woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I am pregnant. So this is like as real a story as you can get. Like, David is messed up. He's betrayed his calling as king. He's betrayed the people of Israel. He's betrayed his friend, Uriah, one of his elite soldiers. He's committed adultery. And of course, most significantly, he has is, is betrayed his God. And here's the interesting thing with David. I said he's kind of like a superhero leading up to this. He is if you kind of don't notice what's going on behind it all. Is that this really doesn't start here. Because scattered amongst the stories of David's victories and successes and achievements is you start to notice something. He first marries a woman named Michael, the daughter of Saul. And then he marries Abigail. And then he marries someone else. And he takes more wives. And then when he becomes king, in addition to his multiple wives that he has, he actually gets what are called concubines. And I don't want to go into that but they're there for his fleshly needs. And then, so he's had this issue all along, and a lot of people will be like, well, why would God allow that? Why would, why, why would the king of Israel be able to do that? Well, God didn't allow it. <laughs> Actually, going back, written by Moses in Deuteronomy in chapter 17, he writes that kings, you must not take many wives because your heart will be led astray. You see, our flesh would deceive us to believe that if we just give in to the temptation for a moment, give in to the desire, that we will be satisfied and we will move on. And so we lie to ourselves. We say, well, just for a moment, just for a night, just for a weekend, just one more fix, one more hit, one more meetup, one more time, and I'm good. I'll be done. And that's a mistake. It's a trap for many of us. Whatever it is, lust, addiction. Some, let's be honest, for a lot of us, it's food. But whatever compromise it is, the mistake is that our flesh is never satisfied. It's not, and it never will be. It's a monster that will continue to consume. It will always want more. And actually, the paradox is the more you feed your flesh, the more it will want and the hungrier it will grow. And that's how a lot of, you know, one thing that I, that I love to do, and I've done, I've, my family did this, and I did this as a, as a kid, and I've just always had a heart for people who were out on the streets. And so, so I talk to people out on the streets a lot. 
And one day I'm, I'm, I'm walking and, and there's a homeless man. And he says to me, Jesus loves you. And I started thinking, I should have I, I told him. And I went in this whole spiral in my mind because then I was like, well, isn't that prideful that I think I should be the one? Why couldn't he tell? You know, and I went on this whole debate with myself. But he's talking to me. And I, and, and I think a lot of times we see someone like that. We just see the issue. We don't see the person. And I want to know the person. Well, what? How did you end up here? He started telling me about his life. That he had a business and he had employees and and he started doing all these things, drugs, all kinds of stuff, compromises, little sins, little things here and there, and he, and, he, and he lost it all. And now here he is on the streets. And it was just that bad choice, the choice to follow that flesh and, and your sin, and it, and it can lead to destruction. And, and David... The man after God's own heart, right now in this story, he's going after his, the desires of his heart, not God's heart. And he messes up. And he does what a lot of us do. Instead of repenting and coming clean and being honest, he tries to cover it up. Remember I went one time and, and uh, man, I'm, yeah, I'm going to say something. And I don't know if I ever talked to my mom about this. So this is, I'm going to get a call from my mom, I think. Oh, well. My mom had this vase that was very precious to her. And one day, me and my brother may or may not have been playing football in the house. And someone that looked a lot like me may have hit it with a football, and it may have broken. And it may have been thrown away somewhere. And then the response may have been, I don't know where the vase is. So, Mom, I don't remember if we talked about this. I'm sorry. I'm, gonna, I'm in trouble, y'all. But David, instead of doing that, he, he tries to cover it up, and it's almost, it would almost be funny if it wasn't so awful what he tries to do. It's, it's like there's comedy to it in the sense he's like trying to, his, his plan escalates and escalates, and it just gets weirder and weirder. So here's what he does. So David calls for Bathsheba's husband, to come home from war. Already this is weird, you know? You, the Navy SEALs, they stay deployed till mission is done. They're, but he's calling, he's calling Uriah. And in verse seven, there's a really awkward exchange because it says, when Uriah came to him, David asked him, how's Yohab doing? By the way, do you, in heaven, man, I don't know if it's gonna be, if I get there and I see Yohab, I'm like, yo, Yohab, you know, yo, Had. He's going to be like, who are you? Anyway, sorry. That's my, um, my weird things that happen in my mind that come up. How the soldiers were and how the war was going. And David said to Uriah, hey, man, go down, go down to your house. Wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace, and a gift from the king was sent after him. So Uriah's got to be weirded out. Any of you, you ever walked into a situation where you just know somebody's like lying? Somebody's trying to cover something up. I feel like David's acting like that, right? He's like looking around. He's like, hey, dude, what's up? And Uriah's like, what's, why did you call me here? You see, what we're missing here is Uriah's a Navy SEAL. He's elite soldier, and he's been called to do just the work of a messenger. So he knows, like, there's, this is, there's something off about this whole thing. And then here's where we see David's plan. He's like, hey, man, while you're here, well, why don't you just go home and relax, get your feet washed? And this is nuanced, and it'd be easy for us to miss because our culture is very different. But back then, they wore sandals everywhere, so everybody got stanky feet, and they're walking around. And so you didn't want those feet to be walking all over your house. So when someone would come into your house, their feet would be washed. And if you were bougie, you had servants that would wash the feet of people. But for the most part, most people, just like Uriah and his household, it would most likely be the wife. It would be Bathsheba that would wash the, 
the feet of the people that would enter the house. So he's saying, go home, relax, have beef Bathsheba, wash your feet. And it says that he sends a gift after them to the house of Uriah. And the Hebrew tradition is that the gift that David sent was food and wine for Uriah's table. You see what he's trying to set up? He might as well put on a Bluetooth speaker with boys to men on it. I just go home, dude. Be with your wife. David's like, thanks for being a messenger for me. As a reward, go home. Let Bathsheba wash your feet, have some wine, relax, spend time with her. It even, it, <laughs> he's trying to set up the parameters for intimacy between Uriah and his wife so that then he can pass off this pregnancy as Uriah's and not his. I mean, he'll have to figure out later down the road when everyone's like, you're you're right, your son looks just like King David. But he can figure that out down the road. So, well, it's just the Israel look, you know, it's the bloodline. But it says in verse 9, but Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all his master's servants and did not go down to his house. Oops, plan didn't work. And the question becomes, why didn't Uriah go home? I mean, how many soldiers, if given the opportunity to take a one-day break from deployment and come home and spend time with their wife, wouldn't do it? And so, but back then, to keep it simple, we don't want to go into all of it, the soldiers of Israel had a covenant with the Lord. They would make a consecration of themselves to the Lord as they were entering into the battle. And part of that consecration of their Selves was the consecration of their bodies, that they will not lay with their wives until the battle is won. That was the commitment to God. And so Uriah, in contrast to King David, is faithful to his agreement with the Lord in his choices. Verse 10, David's told, hey man, Uriah didn't go home. So he asked Uriah, Haven't you just come home from a military campaign? Why didn't you go home? And Uriah is mentioned as being a Hittite, which means that he was foreign born. He's become an Israelite out of conquest. And yet here, Uriah, the foreigner, is having to explain the ritual laws and customs of Israel to Israel's king. And then David just doubles down on the deceptiveness. He tells Uriah, hey, man, hey, bro, stay home one more day. You know, we'll go to Carlos and Mickey's. We'll watch the game. We'll get some margaritas. It's going to be a good time. And then then go home. Yeah? Have some drinks. Go home. But Uriah still does not go home. And then David writes a letter to Yoab, and he gives it to Uriah to bring to him. And the letter says in verse 15, in it he wrote, put Uriah out in front where the fighting is fiercest. Then withdraw from him. So he will be struck down and will die. So David is just making destructive decision after destructive decision. And that's what happens when we're caught in sin like this. It it, it just compounds and it gets bigger and bigger and messier and uglier. And because David cannot face the reality of what he has done, he sends Uriah out to deliver his own death warrant signed with the seal of the king. And it happens. Uriah goes out, faithful to the calling that God has for him. And under the instructions of Yohab, under King David's orders, he is placed in a compromising position. And he, along with several other faithful men of the Israelite army, are killed. And then the text tells us in verse 26, when Uriah's wife, Bathsheba, heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. And after the time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house. She became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. So David, he's like, oh, man, that's too bad about Uriah. I'll I'll take care of Bathsheba. The goodness of my heart, I'll I'll marry her and bring her in. And here David feels like he got away with it. He probably feels a sense of relief, like, okay, cover up, 
executed, we're good. Bathsheba's married to him, and now nobody's going to bat an eye at this pregnancy. And no one but him and Yohab really knows what transpired. But it said the Lord was displeased. And about a year later, God would send the biggest mic drop to David when he would send the prophet Nathan to him. 2 Samuel 12, verse 1. Man, this is intense. I feel like this is like a soap opera. It says, the Lord sent Nathan to David. And when he came to him, he said, there were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. Now check this out, verse five. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Man, nothing gets us enraged like the sins of other people, huh? Oh, how could they do that? How could our president say that? How could that person wear that to church? How could they do that? So David hears this story, and he's enraged at the sin of the rich man. And then in verse 7, Nathan, this is gangster, y'all. He looks at David straight, and he's like, you are the man. I'm not going to drop the mic because I get in trouble with the tech team. And from here, Nathan will tell him how much God has blessed, how much God has favored him. Yet David took that all for granted. And now his choices will bring consequences. And honestly, a lot of horrible things will unfold in the line of David. They'll lose this child that Bathsheba is carrying. The sons of David will have lots of issues. and There will be infighting and deception and division and destruction, and it's all from this one bad choice. Verse 13, David will realize the weight of all of this, and he says, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. Any of you feel like it's a lot of build up and it's like a lot of spiciness and it's a lot of all this stuff and then it's just like oh your sin is taken away like that kind of I, I don't know about you but it kind of upsets our sense of justice in this world like any of you think it's a little too easy for that like David messed up bad he slept with another man's wife he had that man killed he tried to cover it up in this weird way. And, and then God's like, but your sin's taken away. And this right here is an example of the balance between law and gospel that our Lord operates in, that he walks in. God is holy and God is just and God is righteous he is not just pure, he is purity itself. He is not just light, he is light. He is love itself. And sin is the opposite. Sin is working in opposition to everything of God's kingdom, everything that God is. So sin is perversion, sin is darkness, sin is selfishness, sin is pride and hatred. God detests sin because sin is everything opposite of what God stands for. So sin and God can't coexist with one another. God wipes out sin. God eradicates sin. And the reason I'm talking about this right now is that there are two different ways that sin affects our lives, and we see them both at play in the story of David here. There are 
worldly consequences of sin, and there are spiritual consequences. So number two, in a worldly sense, sin has different moral and physical consequences. In a spiritual sense, all sin costs us the same price, separation from God. That's what it does. You see, in the world, some sin might get you sent to jail. Some sin might get you in trouble. Some sin might get your face slapped or or punched in. Some sin might be endorsed by culture or the government. And still some sin that we do may never go noticed by other people. So in the world, there are different consequences physically and morally to your sin. But all sin has the same spiritual consequence, and that is separation from God. So David, right now, he's going to face the worldly consequences of his sin. And we can look at the story and say, how could David do this? Like, David, the one who fought Goliath, David, this, the one who, who, who danced and worshiped before everybody, this, this guy who's experienced so much and had so much devotion and faithfulness to the Lord, how could he do this? And yet, David's story is our story. It's my story, and it's your story. Let me see. Just raise your hand. Who hears without sin? I'm going to lower my hand. Who hears without sexual sin of some kind? Who here has never felt proud? Who here has never felt greed? Whoever has not felt lust? Whoever has not felt envy? Who in here has not entertained ideas in their heart, their mind, and their soul? that they should not. It should be sobering to look at the story of King David and see someone who could be so close to God make a choice that takes him so far from him. And David, to his credit, this time, because the jig's up. There's, There's no more. He doesn't make excuses. He doesn't say, well, Bathsheba was just out there, got the window open, close your window. He doesn't blame her. He simply says, I have sinned against you, Lord. And then David will pray day and night for this child. But the Lord will take the child away from him. And I'm going to invite the worship team to come out at this time. And after the child dies, David goes into the temple and he gets down on his hands and his knees and he prays to the Lord and he doesn't make excuses. He doesn't blame God. He doesn't get angry at God. He repents of his sin and he ends up writing Psalm 51. And I want to read this to you in its entirety. So I think sometimes we hear that word repent in church and that brings up a lot of religious ideas, maybe tradition ideas. Maybe it, it makes us think of people on a street corner with a sign saying, repent, and it's all crazy and stuff. But Psalm 51 is what repentance looks like. It says this, for the director of music, a psalm of David, when the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba, it says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. If you've ever messed up, doesn't it feel like that? It's just always there, always present. It's against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all of my inequity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. 
then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God. You who are God my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken heart, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. And that was a really long intro to tell you that my sermon today is called The Beauty of Being Broken. This scripture is what repentance looks like. You know, repent simply means to turn. The theologian Martin Luther would describe repentance as the way a sunflower turns to face the sun and then it gets its nourishment and it lives. That's what it's like to repent. It's to turn away from these destructive things that have been killing us and eating away at us and we, and we turn and we face the one who can restore us and nourish us and renew us. It's to turn away from the destructive nature of our sin and embrace the redemptive nature of Christ. So we can see something like this, that, that the Lord took away the sin of David who, who really messed up. And it might upset our sense of justice in the world because our world says you get what you deserve. And I, I think all of us would agree David deserves punishment for what he did. But God's justice is that you will get from him what you don't deserve. You get grace. So number three, with the grace of God, a single right choice, repentance, can lead to our restoration. You know, in our sin, we are one choice away from destruction. But did you know you are also at every moment, no matter how many bad choices you make, you are just one choice away to repent and say, I've sinned, God, and I need you. You're just one choice away from restoration and redemption. 1 John 1, 9, we quote it every time we do communion together as a church. But it says, if we confess our sins, that God is faithful and he is just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So if we repent, if we do what David did and say, God, I messed up, I sinned against you. You see, for us to forgive somebody, we gotta like work ourselves up for it. There's gotta be time, sometimes therapy, talking, healing, and then we feel, okay, I'm ready to forgive. God's not like that. You can come to God and say, God, I messed up, and he will immediately say, I forgive you. No second thought. There will be worldly consequences for David. Sometimes there are worldly consequences of our sin and our choices. I've met some of the most devoted Christians I've gotten to meet were people who met Jesus in prison as they faced the worldly consequence for their sin, yet God cleansed the unrighteousness in their soul. But God clears David of the spiritual consequence, the eternal consequence and whereas David was unfaithful, God would remain faithful. And he would keep his covenant to David. And out of the line of David, the king of kings, the greatest king would be born. We always talk about King David as if he is Israel's greatest king. Guess what? He's not. The greatest king of Israel is Jesus. The greatest king of all is Jesus. And this king would not have the issues of you and I. This king would not have the issues of David. He would never forsake his duty. And he would fulfill every demand of the law perfectly and completely. And he would uphold it in all righteousness so that then he could be laid down as the perfect sacrifice for all. So that the separation that existed because of our choice of sin would be dismantled and torn down and broken forever so that you could be restored into the embrace and the love of God the Father Almighty. And to receive that, all we need is to repent and turn from our sin and receive the work of Jesus on the cross. So the good news is this, is that whatever your life has looked like, maybe you've messed up a lot. Maybe you believe yourself to be outside of the, 
grace of God for what you've done. Well, the truth is, you're only outside the grace of God by your choice. Because God already chose you. But God doesn't force himself on you. He allows you to choose. You can choose to live in your sin and shame. You can choose to live a life of destruction and brokenness and emptiness. Or you can choose to repent of your sin and receive his forgiveness. David messed up, he failed, but in the end, he made the right choice. He chose the Lord. And after all this, in 2 Samuel 12, 24, it says, then David comforted his wife, Bathsheba, and went into her and lay with her, and she bore a son, and he called his name Solomon. And uh, the child, Solomon, his name means peace with God. Now, some of you might think that they're kind of doing that, like, well, the first one was taken from us, so let's try to, like, this one, peace with God, you know, let's throw that out there that it's wishful thinking on their part. But if anything, what does this tell us? It tells us, can there be peace after devastating sin in your life? Yes, there can be. Because look at how that ends. And the Lord loved him. God looked at little Solomon and he loved him. In fact, God loves him so much that out of all of David's children, the one who would be Israel's next great king would be the one that was born out of this broken situation. It would be Solomon, and God would put his grace on him. And Bathsheba would become the mother of Israel's next great king. Sometimes I think we talk about Bathsheba as if she's like this lady of the night, this promiscuous person. Bathsheba becomes, and in fact, the tradition of the rabbis. How many of you have ever read Proverbs 31? Because we, we talk about that right a lot, the Proverbs 31 woman. Well, there's kind of an obscure king referenced as penning it. But most rabbis and most Hebrew scholars believe that King Solomon just used a pen name when writing Proverbs 31. And that actually what he was relating was advice given to him by his mother about the type of woman that should be his wife. And who is that woman? Bathsheba. So when you read Proverbs 31, that's the words, at least in the Hebrew tradition, of Bathsheba, of what a righteous woman looks like. In fact, in Matthew 1, verse 6, the genealogy of Jesus himself. It says, And Jesse, the father of King David, David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Who's that? Bathsheba. And throughout the genealogy that leads to Jesus, and look, it doesn't gloss it over. It doesn't say, And David, who married Bathsheba, and they had Solomon. No, it says, David, the father of Solomon, by the wife of Uriah, it doesn't gloss over what happened. And throughout this genealogy that leads to Jesus, there are broken people with rough stories and broken moments. And yet they'll all be given the grace of God. So what does that tell us? It tells us that he has room in his story for us today. No matter what you've done, I would wager to bet most of you haven't done something like King David has done. But even if you did, God has grace for you. And all it has, and it can all start today with just a moment of repentance before him. In fact, your name could be listed in this whole line because the Bible makes it quite clear that when we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we become his sons and his daughters. We become a part of his genealogy, even with the brokenness of our past. Amen? So I want to invite you to pray a prayer of repentance, and then our, our prayer teams are going to be available for you. 
And we're going to go into just a time of worship before the Lord. But I'm going to give you this opportunity today to repent like David did and receive grace and forgiveness. I'm telling you, brother, I'm telling you, sister, it doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what you've done. Jesus paid for it already. And the thing he wants most is for you to come home to him. Amen. Would you pray with me? Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying for me. Even in my brokenness, even in my messiness, you've loved me and you have come. And by the work of your blood shed on the cross, you have cleansed me of all my failures and all my sin. And today I receive you as Lord and Savior, creating me a clean and a pure heart before you, my God. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.